During the last couple of OST videos here, there was one thing in common. They were made around the i386 architecture. A few months ago, I started the transition to x86-64 and it was not easy. Like, at all. Stay with me through this mess of emotions. Around the start of March, I was happy with how Kavos had ended up. It was however a fool to the brim with bugs that caused instabilities, random crashes, memory and stack corruptions, etc. This is literally peak software engineering. <laughs> While fixing whatever that is, I decided to bite the bullet and go for a full 64-bit migration, rewriting whatever was necessary. Note that I stayed on 32 bits for so long, since I didn't really know what I was doing and wanted to learn OS development properly, before moving to the harder architectures. A very big mistake I made was accidentally masking all compiler warnings in my makefile. You might say, oh but it's just warnings, and you would be dead wrong. Let's say you use a function without importing the headers of said function. You're not really supposed to do that, but hang with this example, I guess. Then the arguments you pass will be 32 bits wide by default, and a warning will be issued. This was a pretty big mistake that went unnoticed, but didn't cause much trouble. When I went to x86-64 though, I sometimes had to move around addresses which, by nature, were now 64 bits wide. A lot of very hard to debug errors could have been avoided, had I not hidden compiler warnings. After that I learned my lesson and made warnings appear as errors in every compilation. Anyways, in order to move to x86-64, I had two roads. Continue using grub and make my own loader to transition to long mode, which is what we call 64-bit mode, x86-64, or AMD64. You will hear all of those terms interchangeably throughout this video. The other option was using a bootloader made specifically for x86-64 that dropped you straight into long mode. Since I was already using grub with multiboot, I first tried to manually switch to long mode and do the necessary code loading. Turns out that was convoluted at best since you were merging together 32-bit, 64-bit code. It was a mess in general. The only option left was a 64-bit specific bootloader. I replaced grub with limine which is exactly what I was looking for. Lyman also supports UEFI natively, which I hadn't had any success over on the Grub side. Seriously, Grub's multiboot makes everything incredibly difficult, despite them claiming they want everybody to use the multiboot protocols. Fun fact, not even Linux utilizes it, it uses its own thing. With compiled 64-bit code being booted successfully, and everything bootloader related neatly organized, it was time to let the migration games begin. Porting over stuff such as the GDT, IRQ or ISR, which are responsible for interrupts, was simple enough. Remember, both x 632 and x 664 are in the same parent architecture, making these kinds of changes pretty easy to deploy. Migrating device drivers was a bit of a headache. Now that I mentioned that, let me show you something cool. What you are seeing is Kavos running on my pavilion laptop. Why is that a big deal? It is an AHCI SATA only laptop and doesn't support the IDE. Since the last video, I've made a simple AHCI PCI driver that now works on real hardware too, as you can see. It also works under every hypervisor I have tested against. It was by far the most involved driver I've written and required a lot of effort though. Of course, changes had to be made to the way I interfaced with system memory. Long mode paging is similar in philosophy to protected mode paging, it just has more tables you have to take care of. Also, since the memory ceiling is obviously increased by a lot, I now had to correctly store and manage 64-bit wide memory addresses. As far as allocating and freeing memory goes, I would say my previous bitmap allocation algorithm was quite well organized, so migrating it over to 64 bits did not cause much trouble. What was of trouble was liballoc, which was previously used for kernel space malloc and free operations. It was intended only for 32-bit usage, and hence had to be replaced. I went for Douglas malloc, which was previously used in the Linux kernel if I recall correctly. 
It's very customizable and works under many different configurations via pre-process or hashtag defines. For a while I was using my own FAT32 driver, which had quite a few issues. It seemed to cause random memory overrides and corrupt the stack a lot. The code was so rust and bad in quality that I decided to just drop it for the time being and use FATFS. FATFS is a very small library for embedded systems that handles most of the low-level file system stuff for you. I might decide to go back to a custom implementation in the future, but for now I'm happy with it. My old solution for drawing to the frame buffer was using a library, but I quickly found out it had problems being compiled for a 64-bit target. Instead of fixing it, I rolled up my own solution using the PC screen font file format. That was a much better choice anyway, since I wasn't using most of the functionality the old library even had. Also, look at this cool font. It's called Goho font and is released in nearly every format you can imagine. This is the final result. However, we are missing user space stuff, binaries, and some cool Linux apps and other ports. Stay subscribed to not miss the next video, where I will cover all of those and much more. The project is on GitHub as usual, so you can also take a look there. Until the next one, stay safe everybody.